Okay, well, good afternoon uh, from here, there, and all the way across Canada on Thursday, December 8th. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I, the, I am Martha Toy, the, uh, the host of today's uh, 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 webinar. And we are very, very excited to be uh, hearing uh, a group presentation from Ivan Taylor, George Coppice, and Al Thibault. And without further ado, gentlemen, uh, take it away. Great. Well, I think we, we agreed that I would uh, formally introduce uh, uh, the, uh, the guys who did the heavy lifting. Um, that was, that's Ivan and, and Al. Uh, so let me just give you a brief intro for, uh, for Ivan. Uh, he's been a member of, of the System Dynamics Society since 97. And he's president and senior modeler for policy uh, dynamics since 2001. He retired from defense research and development uh, not that long ago, I guess, 10 years ago now. And uh, he has been a mentor for, system, for the System Dynamics Society uh, since 2020 and has worked with over 20 mentees around the world. And this, he initiated this oil science modeling work, which was developed with two of his mentees, Saroy Kuhl and Burmi Falebita. Fale I think, I hope I get the names right. Um, and it was published in the International Journal of Energy and Environmental Engineering, an earlier version of this model. And then Al, Al Thibault is a Canadian professional engineer, certified management consultant, uh, he also holds an advanced certificate for executive uh, for executives in management and innovation from MIT uh, Sloan School of Management. I actually discovered through this process that we have some interesting uh, overlap. I also got my original training in uh, system dynamics from the MIT School Sloan School and uh, and John Sturman and Peter Senge and Jay Forrester. I was you know, in in the early nineties. Al is currently a PhD candidate in uh, energy engineering at the University of North Dakota. So he's working hard on his PhD. And uh, his research includes uh, developing hybrid system dynamics and agent based models for scenario testing of uh, value chain uh, options for the rare, rare earth sector. So there's some overlap here with the work. And uh, you know, to further round out my background, I did start my my, I'm also a professional engineer originally and start, started my career in the oil sands industry. So there is some, some know-how of this sector. And you know, again, I want to emphasize that the, the bulk of the heavy lifting was done by Ivan and Al. They did all the model work. I provided some, some additional comments, uh, but most of the work has been done by Ivan and Al. So thanks very much, guys. You kept us on the straight and narrow, George. Well. It was a meandering path, but we crossed the straight and narrow every once in a while, I guess. <laughs> Good. Uh, Ivan, are you the main presenter or is Al? No, Al's going to start us off. Good. Al, up to you. Uh, very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as you can see, the topic for today is the system dynamics model of value chains. And uh, as we get through, we'll see that we're and as George mentioned, building on a, a previous oil sands model, and we've extended it to show the impact <laughs> of value chains. So next slide, please. Uh, so today's presentation, we'll just um, do a, a really quick uh, introduction to value chains. I think we want to get to the model as quickly as possible. So I'll do the, the value chain introduction, turn it over to Ivan. Uh, talk about the model and the preliminary results and then uh, uh, limitations and George will bring us home with uh, future work and observations. Next slide, please. Value chains are uh, uh, really interesting topic for me, obviously, uh, the core of my uh, PhD research. And they were first introduced by uh, Dr. Michael E. Porter, Harvard uh, Business School prof. Uh, it started in 1985 um, with a competitive uh, advantage book. And he dealt with value chains at the, at the firm sector. And this is really important because uh, at an individual firm sector, the value chain um, starts to look a, a lot like the, uh, the supply chain. And then this is where some of the the um, interesting um, 
use of the term value chain starts to emerge. In 1990, he published a book, Competitive Advantage of Nations, and where he extended the value chain uh, concept to international competition. He never used the term uh, global value chains. That came later. Uh, Professor Gary Giraffe down in North Carolina, I think, was one of the first to use it. There could have been others. But the idea of the global, uh, a global perspective of value chains, I'll, I'll use it that way, are the bullets that we've listed here. It's, it's really a, a, a network a system of, of activities connected by linkages. So those are quotes from Competitive Advantage of Nations, the 1990 book. Um, and gaining competitive advantage requires the firm's value chain is managed as a system. So and it's the next bullet increasingly uh, uh, the advantage is how well can a company manage this entire system? And uh, you, you get the, the, the idea here from the, from the 20, 30 years ago, uh, Dr. Porter was all, had been talking about value chains, not as a chain, it's not a linear set of activities. It is a system, a network of activities that are used to implement the company's strategy. So it's it's not a chain. The supply uh, the supply chain is definitely a part of any um, uh, company strategy, but uh, the value chain encompasses more than that. It's all the things that you need to implement a strategy. So the key uh, key uh, thought that it came out of that research is that Porter has been a system thinker for a long time. So just uh, like uh, your your friend Martha that. Uh, uh, the marketing prof at U of C, uh, you, you just you just find these really interesting uh, system thinkers popping up all over the place. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to give a a really quick, I won't dwell on this slide. Supply chain management, uh, it was not the work of a single author. It emerged over quite a long period of time. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, I won't go through all these things, but uh, definitely one of the big um, changes in the way supply chains are, are managed and conceived was as, uh, uh, as computer technology uh, arrived and became really powerful in the, and especially in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so we went uh, to uh, ERPs, Enter Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, of which uh, Oracle and SAP are probably the most famous but uh, uh, lots of other uh, systems too. So uh, just the, the slide is just contrast supply <clears throat> chains as an evolution, uh, industry evolution, whereas uh, Porter, a uh, single person, was uh, really uh, key in uh, developing value chains. Uh, next, please. So here uh, we see Porter's original value um, chain diagram on the bottom, you can see it, it's it's uh, depicted graphically as a linear chain from inbound to operations as a linear chain, that would be the supply chain. And then the value chain encompasses um, other support activities that are labeled, like the firm in infrastructure, the way the company's organized, there's human resources, there's technology and R&D and procurement, legal. Um, and then the, those even those support activities are the way a company's strategy gets implemented. So it's the combination of the value chain and the supply chain that really determine uh, whether a company is going to achieve competitive advantage. So there's a whole bunch more um, that Porter has to say on the topic, but um, uh, this uh, that'll be good for today because uh, the, the sections that of the model that uh, I contributed and I've been helped a lot with and um, really um, cleaning them up and, and making them efficient in, uh, in the terms of the model uh, were the some value chain components that we'll demonstrate today. Uh, next, please. So if I can um, kind of put a, a bit of a analogy together for, uh, to contrast um, value chain and supply chain. There's a there's a, a classic engineering electrical engineering problem called the inverted pendulum and it's a, a dynamic control problem which is exactly what system dynamics is all about. So you you see there's a, 
an upside down pendulum. The mass on the end of the pendulum, we'll just use in the, for the today's analogy, we'll say that's the product that we're trying to ship. And then this cart is riding on some rails. So it's a two, it's in this, and this model, it's a two dimensional problem. And you can see there's a force acting from left to right. In actual fact, it, it is bi-directional. The forces can go either way and displace it, the cart along the, uh, the rail, the, the value X there is the location um, uh, on the X axis of, of the cart. And so of course the idea is to keep that pendulum uh, straight up and down and uh, uh, so that the cart can move, uh, just focus on moving. The energy of the, in the system is focused on moving the cart and not on stabilizing the pendulum. So there's two, there's two scenarios here. One is where there's no perturbations, no F, F is zero. There's no, nothing bumping the cart. And it's really hard to see, and uh, the arrows kind of got moved. But if you look down in the lower right-hand corner, the, the uh, section called control work, the amount of work that the system has to do to keep the pendulum straight up and down is depicted first by the blue line where there's where there's no perturbations, and then the red line where there are, there are random perturbations, uh, which is the graph on on the left. I just set it to a random uh, number so it would go up and down. So when, as you can um, well imagine, if there's nothing bumping the cart, the amount of work that's required to keep the pendulum vertical is pretty negligible. Um, there's uh, some initial you can see in the upper graph. It's really hard to see, but you can see little blue lines in the middle that start just above zero and they oscillate for a little while and then they actually uh, stay along uh, the zero uh, value on the y-axis and, uh, and run along to the end of the model time. <laughs> but when there's perturbations uh, on the top graph, you can see there's a, a bit of an upward um, um, motion on the on a, the long red line, and then it drops down to about minus three and a half. And there's continuing oscillations because you can see the the it tracks with the oscillations down below, but the stabilization routine is taken over, and it's keeping the pendulum vertical. But the control work down in the lower right uh, continues. So initially, it's, it ramps up quite quite strongly. And then it hits a knee in the curve and then it sort of levels off. And that's, so where it bends down, that would be around uh, uh, time seven on the upper graph. And then it continues on uh, at, a, at a relatively more modest pace as, it's, as the stabilization works. So the, uh, the message here is that even though uh, the car, to, the, the uh, the cart is stabilized and the pendulum is staying vertical because there's ongoing perturbations. The control work continues to increase. So there's the level, right? So we're we're seeing uh, the constant increase in energy uh, required to keep uh, to keep things stable, and that's that's the value chain. What is the best corporate strategy to keep? Uh, to minimize the control work as the supply chain does its work to to move the cart um, and the the goods to be shipped uh, down the track. So I hope that's not too uh, confusing, but that's my best analogy for today. Uh, I think now we're over to Ivan. Okay, thanks, Al, for that introduction to supply chains and value chains. Um, sorry, uh, we're going to talk about this particular model, which is uh, a model of the supply chain and the value chain in uh, in the Canadian oil sands. Uh, so there's a, a number of parts of the model, uh, which I'll show. Uh, it begins with uh, extraction of oil and shipping of the of of the oil of the crude. Uh, and then I also, it, it, the extraction is based on the workforce and the productivity and the uh, the industry produces economic benefits. Um, and, and then and then we we looked at at something called strategic focus, which was um, which was where the value chain comes in. And the strategic focus uh, determines, you know whether 
this uh, industry will focus on on investment uh, in 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 capital and 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 R and D to for production, or or whether they will invest in in, in environmental, social, or and governance. So um, so the strategic focus uh, allows you to to modify the, um, the the direction that the industry is going. Uh, and, and when we talk about uh, the investment in, in environmental, social, and governance, uh, we also have models of social benefits uh, and environmental benefits uh, that come from those investments. So the model, as I said, uh, it starts off with a, a pretty detailed model of extraction of oil. Um, and and shipping uh, and and diluting uh, and upgrading the oil for shipping. So this uh, this shows the the extraction on on the left hand side and the the shipping the dilution uh, the uh, the upgrading and the and the shipping on the left hand side. And and then that's we don't model, we're not we decided not to model um, the more downstream issues of refineries we wanted to focus basically on on the um, on the oil sands itself uh, so this is uh, this is a validation uh, that we did um, that that compared the results of the model to projections uh, by Canada's energy regulator and the nice thing about this result is that um, is the Canada's energy regulator uh, used uh, you know real data uh, for the for for the period uh, 2010 to 2020, and you can see this dip in 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 production uh, during COVID, um, and then and then and then they projected into the future until 2050. So this is based on on the energy regulators. Um, a best estimate of of the policies that the government will put in place and 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 uh, and various issues like pipeline construction and uh, and uh, um, and technology improvement. Uh, so this is uh, this is our, our our view of the workforce, uh, and 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 as as you probably already know, there's two types of of extraction of oil. There's in situ uh, extraction, which which I call drilling, and then there's uh, um, basically a mining, which uh, which is like a strip mining uh, of the of the land. So th th this is the workforce in these two areas uh, that we that we modeled, uh, and and then the productivity um, we assumed that the productivity um, in terms of barrels per person per day would decrease over time slightly because uh, what, I, what, I, what we felt was that, uh, you know, that as, as more and more oil is extracted, it'll be harder and harder to find uh, uh, easy ways to get the oil in the future. So we did, uh, we modeled this sort of uh, idea of, of decreasing productivity over the long run. Uh, so then we have uh, the economic benefits, and, and the first thing that we we recognized is that the price of oil is is a huge impact on on profitability, um, and uh, and so we modeled uh, we actually got data on the price of oil, um, and, and and then we uh, we use that price to determine uh, how much profit could be obtained based on the the production rate. Uh, and, and we we had a very simple approach that that we had these break even costs, and so the break even cost uh, would tell whether uh, the whether the, the the production would be uh, uh, creating a profit or a loss. So so for example, um, if the if the price is greater than the break even price, there would be a profit generated, and if the if the if the price is less than the break even price, then it would create a loss and, and possibly a contraction in the industry. <laughs> And then we take this a little farther, and and we get into uh, economic benefits, which uh, which we look at in terms of economic benefits to uh, to Canadians. So we have uh, corporate taxes, carbon taxes, royalties, and wages go into uh, economic benefits for uh, all Canadians. So so for example, the corporate taxes, carbon taxes, and royalties go into the government. Um, the government funding that allows uh, policies to be implemented to help all Canadians. Uh, 
we do have a, an idea that uh, that there is a trade-off that uh, that, for example, um, ESG investments might re might be impacted on, on the on the economic benefits, and we have this idea of economic well-being, which is basically how much has the economic benefits increased over time, or or decreased. So and then and then we have uh, the strategic focus that I, that I, that is a big part of of this model and 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 really a brand new addition and a whole new focus of of the model from the previous publication, and we have this idea of a strategic focus where one is is maximum core investment and that basically involves investing in 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 R and D and production issues. And then 10 is the maximum ESG focus, which involves um, investment in environmental, social, and governance uh, um, uh, issues. So we have uh, we we can change we'll we'll change the strategic focus and see how the results change. Uh, in terms of the environmental uh, government, oh, social and governance, we have, the, as I said, the two pools of investment. We have the core business investment that is moves that gets to a, an annual operations capital spending. And, and we looked at the, that primarily at the upgrader expansion as, as, a, as a place to invest in production. And then ESG uh, investments would be towards energy transition, uh, so social and infrastructure spending, uh, annual emissions, sorry, annual emissions. And uh, I guess there should be a connection there that I'm missing. Oh yeah, there is, sorry. And annual, annual emissions for, for mining and annual emissions from drilling. So those are the, um, the ways that the ESG spending would, would, uh, would be divided. Uh, okay, here's the social benefits model. And we see that we have, a, basically we're talking about social benefits for, for First Nations people. Uh, and, uh, and we feel that you know, by investing in social uh, aspects that the, that the industry might invest in infrastructure and services that could be provided to First Nations people. And, and, there, and, there, and then we have this idea of, of, of social well-being, which is a combination of infrastructure and services and the population. Uh, and, uh, and, and also the population of First Nations people will be impacted by what we felt they would be impacted by the emissions. Uh, and now we have the environmental benefits, which uh, we talk about wildlife and fish primarily, uh, in, but we also have in emissions in there. And emissions is, is a huge dominating factor in environmental well-being, which I'll get into next. But fishing and wildlife are a huge aspect of, of the social benefits for First Nations, obviously. Uh, and then uh, the next element is emissions. And, uh, and, and we, we modeled the emissions intensity from mining and drilling. And then we had this idea of abatement mm -hmm. and investments in, in, in reduction of, uh, of emissions for both areas. And, and then we had a total emissions uh, based on the, this is emissions uh, per barrel, or, and, and this is total emissions based on the total production. Okay, so now we'll get into changing the strategic focus. So there's three, uh, three values that we looked at. Um, the, the value of three for strategic focus is primarily investing in core business issue, uh, uh, investments. Uh, and, and the strategic focus of seven is, is, is investing a lot of effort into ESG. And, and, and investment and a strategic focus of five is, is, is obviously in between. So this shows the ESG investment pool uh, based on various strategic focuses. And, and you can see that obviously when the strategic focus is seven, uh, we have more investment in ESG. Here is, uh, here's an interesting slide on, on how this ESG investment will impact emissions. So, um, we can see that, uh, that, that with uh, more ESG spending uh, and, and will re result in, in more uh, abatement uh, of, of, of emissions. And, and therefore, in, in the model, we expect that with the uh, proper amount of ESG spending, we, we can get to net zero uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2050, which I, I think is a, is a, very, a very nice result. 
Uh, now, economic well-being uh, is impacted also by the strategic focus, and we can see here that uh, that ESG spending will impact the economic benefits. So you get the most benefits when the strategic focus is three. And that's an interesting result because um, not only are you getting uh, benefits from the, the profitability of the companies and the corporate taxes, but you're also getting uh, a lot of carbon taxes. So as we reduce the amount of carbon produced by the um, the oil sands, we will reduce the amount of carbon taxes and therefore remove some of the possible benefits that come to Canadians in general through the uh, through the payment of carbon taxes to support government programs. But but one of the I guess one of the things we can see is that you still can obtain uh, some some positive economic benefits even with large investments in ESG. Here's the social benefits. Uh, we see here that we don't have a lot of uh, influence over, over the social benefits, and, and maybe we need to work on, on this part of the model a little, a little bit more. But we can see here that this one is being sort of the, the initial value and, 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 the, and the relative value goes, is going up. So we're, we're getting more and more social benefits over, over time. Uh, environmental benefits is a, is a huge is a huge improvement. So, the the scale on those earlier slides was in in the order of one one to five, whereas the scale on on the environmental is one to forty, and that's because um, the emissions become low, and that means the environment improves immensely. So as the emissions go to zero, the environment improves exponentially. So that uh, that's a that, that's an a, I think a very positive result. A and the environmental well-being, you know, I think will dominate the whole the whole the whole issue of of well-being in by, by ESG uh, spending. Okay, so that uh, that's the model. Um, we, and as uh, as a summary, uh, like I said, we. Uh, we looked at uh, at the value chain and the supply chain, and, and and basically the original model of the oil sands was a supply chain model, and and we introduced this idea of, of of value chains where profits can be reinvested in either production or ESG, and 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 that can lead to you know improvements in various areas, and the model itself was ex modeled ex extraction, shipping, profit, economic benefits, social services, infrastructure benefits to First Nations, environmental impacts, emissions, land, water, wildlife, fish, and strategic focus uh, of reinvestment of profits in capital investment, R&D, ESG spending. And, and the takeaway that I, I think we can take from the, this, these results is that we can still obtain modest economic benefits and obtain huge uh, amounts of environmental benefits from investment in ESG spending. I'll pass it over to George to talk about uh, limitations and future work. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so whenever you do go and get involved in a modeling exercise, it always gives you uh, uh, all kinds of new insights and opportunities for further work. So this is more uh, p possibilities that arose as, as a result of the modeling work for, for additional uh, consideration and work. So the first one is the uh, currently uh, the available cash is essentially based on the set is allocated between ESG kind of spending and uh, and just growing the business core business. Uh, there is a third application of the money, and that is to uh, give money back to investors. And essentially, expansion of uh, oil sands, as is modeled in this particular model, will to a certain extent also be. Um, I guess dependent on the appetite of investors to allocate money to uh, to new new facilities. So we might and and investors aren't going to just allocate the money based on a simple algorithm. They might uh, the, their view will be influenced by by their beliefs about the future. So the thinking of investors uh, will will likely play a role in whether or not the expansion proceeds. Uh, as per like the maximum possible rate or or maybe less than that. Um, so the, the two-way slider may have to become a three-way slider where some of the money goes back to to investors and influences their their appetite for more more expansion. Uh, the second uh, item that was identified is 
uh, a lot of this uh, future growth and expansion will require capital spending, which in itself provides benefits in terms of uh, jobs, uh, benefits to, to the provincial uh, revenue. And in, in, at the peak year in 2014, $80 billion was spent on uh, expansion. And uh, that collapsed as a result of oil price uh, uh, reductions, collapsed to $20 billion. That, that delta makes a huge difference in terms of number of jobs and uh, tax revenue. Uh, third item is uh, uh, one of the expenses that companies face is uh, ro royalties. And uh, a lot of uh, oil sands companies enjoy a royalty holiday. They, they could defer paying royalties until their original investment was recouped. And that's currently happening for a lot of facilities. So all of a sudden, there's a huge increase in the royalty revenue for the province that uh, would uh, uh, affect the environment or economic well-being of the, of the province. Uh, fourth item is uh, the whole issue of pipeline growth. The environmental movement has been very successful and effective at choking off expansion by opposing pipelines. So the degree to which they will help with or allow further pipeline uh, expansions might have an influence in uh, whether or not this industry is capable of growing by, between now and 2050. Um, the next item is the, the whole concept of break-even prices. Often that is understood as the break-even price to generate positive cash flow. But there's another break-even price, and that is the price that is required to, uh, to support uh, capital investment, to provide a return on investment. So that might have to be considered as well. And then uh, I think a lot of the discussion already revolved around uh, the issues of the, of the, the degree of uh, support that is provided by, uh, by First Nations. And I think we might want to look more at what influences the... Uh, the level of support and opposition that is provided by First Nations, especially if uh, new facilities require more land and, and uh, pipeline right-of-ways. And not just the First Nations, but uh, environmental movement and, and the public in general uh, will be influenced by a degree to we, how we manage, how the industry manages the whole ESG uh, picture. So there's lots of Lots of opportunity for additional dynamics to be considered that might influence the future growth. Um, and I'm sure uh, and if, if we were to undertake more work on this, uh, additional ideas would arise as well. But overall, I think the, uh, the model was uh, quite a, an effective uh, undertaking and uh, especially the use of the strategic slider to, uh, to show that there isn't uh, 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 a silver bullet uh, that uh, sliding the uh, you know the investment dollars over to predominantly one side or the other isn't necessarily going to uh, make this industry succeed. Ivan and Al, any additional comments? Um, Martha, any questions? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for an extremely uh, clear uh, and uh, well-explained um, presentation. I really um, found it helpful, uh, Al, your initial introduction to how the, the term value is uh, distinct, value chain is distinguished from supply chain. Um, and along the, the line of, uh, along those lines, I guess I, I would wonder uh, for Mr. Porter, who seemed to get the ball rolling, would, it, it, do you know what the initial um, uh, situation, I'm curious about how this kind of a concept um, is is discovered uh, and, uh, and integrated into, I guess, the, the mental model of, of uh, what a supply chain is, is what, what caused this initial kind of friction or sense of something's not right or you know a, a sense of that the, the whole story isn't being told here that drove Mr. Porter to coming up with the concept of value chain to begin with. Uh, 
I think it's a combination of things, and uh, and Ivan and I sort of talked about it. He, uh, I'll just I'll just give a little opinion, and I know uh, from talking to Ivan during this modeling exercise that he's also studied Porter, but like Michael E. Porter has been recognized as a really, really, really bright guy for a long time, and he, he okay. achieved a lot to be a prof at uh, at Harvard in the business school um, at a at a relatively young age. And uh, he started publishing in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And I think, I think uh, the best I can figure, Martha, is that uh, it just kind of layered on one another. He'd do some work and he'd get some feedback and say, okay, so this is the next thing. Uh, he's also famous for uh, Porter's Five Forces competition and uh, a number of other um, uh, really iconic uh, business uh, competitive <laughs> analysis kinds of um, things. So um, right, right. it, and then once he published the initial work on uh, the firm level of, of value chains, he, in the, in the introduction to the competitive advantage of nations, the second book, he explained that he, he got a, it wasn't just Michael Porter. He put together a team, I think a set of 20 people, really serious people and did surveys all across the world and got it with his reputation at that time was able to get a, a lot of great input and uh, data and helped him develop the, the global uh, idea of competitive advantage. There's a, a quite a number of YouTube presentations with my okay. supporters that are great. Ivan, anything I miss? Yeah, I think uh, I think that the competitive advantage idea is huge uh, in his work, um, and I think the competitive advantage of nations has to a lot to do with um, with the supply chain. So the idea is that um, you know basically uh, some nations will have a competitive advantage in one part of the supply chain and other nations will have a competitive advantage in other parts of the supply chain. And, and by working together, nations can, can really optimize the supply chain. And I think basically um, the extension of that into the value chain is the idea that, um, that, that basically, um, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of profit maximization, you know, is not the only, it's not the only viewpoint. And that, that, that there is um, other aspects of, of uh, competitive advantage uh, or, or, or aspects of, of, of the industries that can lead to more competitive advantage if they can buy into more than just a profit motive yeah. and possibly producing value um, more than just to shareholders, but also to, to the public in general and yeah. to, uh, to nations. So this, yeah. this, this is just an extension of the concept of competitive advantage uh, to, to basically, you know, as, 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 as we all know, uh, we, 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 in system dynamics, we talk about synergistic relationships and positive feedback loops. So right. I think, you know, the, the value chain is, a, is, a, is an aspect of a positive feedback, feedback loop where more and more investment in value uh, can, can lead to more and more competitive advantage. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, for sure. So what, um, if, I should, what uh, if I can just add a, a quick thing, uh, Ivan's spot on with all of uh, that. It, it, what attracted me to the applying value chain analysis to the rare earth industry is as it tries to uh, disentangle itself from a Chinese monopoly situation, uh, the idea of clusters and uh, working together, really focusing on competitive value working together is something that's absolutely required and, and um, it's, it's evident in a number of places, but sadly lacking here in Canada. So we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, sense, I sense that that's um, key, key as well as a, a real leverager of the, of the transition to, um, uh, and, and really um, uh, putting or uh, uh, promoting the visibility of, of um, uh, working at a value chain level as a over and above just a supply chain level of an analysis, and, uh, because I can't help but think there is just such so much energy, uh, um, mental, uh, mental and, and and heart energy, I would say, to uh, to collaborate. Uh, the 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 people they so under people so understand that it's all about. 
uh, the science of networking, really, the science of collaboration, I think, is is going to come into and uh, is really going to have to mature alongside the science of competition and and competitive advantage, and and to and to show how there is a very synergistic place for 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 both of us, both of that, uh, both of those um and uh, ener energies. Uh, to be of greatest benefit to everyone. Um, in the spirit of um, uh, now, you you've looked at um, the uh, the uh, one one segment of the energy uh, the energy picture uh, the energy supply, if you will, which moves the global economy forward. Um, how do you see your your work, and I guess in the spirit of uh, collaborating and competitive using the idea of competitive advantage, how do you see the the fossil fuel industry um, pair, pair, collaborating and pairing up with uh, some people pe people, for example, in the hydrogen energy focused uh, industry, which is pretty rudimentary in Canada? Uh, but is going to appears to if the trends are are going to continue. I think it's going to in, increase in prominence in the energy industry in uh, uh, in, in in general. And how do you see the what we know what you've captured in the fossil fuel industry in terms of value chain uh, assessment? How do you see? How do you see your work uh, extending into or comparing with what, what have you got to learn? What, what have they got? What are the folks in the hydrogen industry got to learn from you? Uh, and what do you have to learn from the hydrogen industry? Because the, the hydrogen industry is a key focus of that captures a, a lot of the environmental, uh, indigenous, all of the all of the green energy is is uh, not all, but there is increasing amount of attention being paid to the hydrogen uh, uh, industry as a source of energy. Uh, and how, how, how do you see this work, uh, which is looking at the fossil fuel energy source uh, in comparison and with an, with an eye to using competitive advantage to help us transition and uh, see us uh, more in a in a win win uh, situation with uh, the planet and um, uh, quality of life, uh, wildlife, fishing. Every everyone apparently stands to win by transitioning. I don't think that it's going to be strictly off fossil fuels and into the hydrogen industry, but there's going to have to be some partnering, I think, and mutual recognition if this is going to be yeah. done well, as harmoniously as possible in, in, in we had uh, we had a uh, part of the ESG spending uh, uh, fraction was was towards the energy transition uh, and uh, okay. so so that was in our model already and I think you know maybe George can speak more to this but I think the oil industry is recognizing um, that they need to diversify for the future. Um, and right. maybe, and, and maybe, maybe what you're getting at is, is you know, that the oil industry will no longer be the oil industry, but the energy industry, and mm -hmm. and the energy industry could include many other things than oil, uh, in the long term, you know. Right. But in you right. know, they have to make that transition from oil to uh, other sources of energy. What what do you think about that, George? No, I think that's right. And I think from, from a system dynamics modeling perspective, I think this uh, speaks to the existence of a number of balancing loops, uh, which really uh, means that if you, and they might be an invisible during a normal growth phase of an organization, uh, but if you, if you really uh, get uh, critical stakeholders aligned against you, then they will uh, get, uh, they will uh, reinforce or grow this balancing loop to the point where it chokes off the growth so you can't right. you can't really consistently uh, tick off uh, critical stakeholders and expect to survive so in in this case like the public in general or the perception of uh, being environmentally not 
not responsible. Uh, that will result in uh, opposing forces that will kill off uh, kill off growth. So from that point of view, I think uh, lessons are learned for uh, energy transition is if you if you get involved in uh, the companies want to secure their own survival by getting involved in different elements of the energy industry, they they still have to think about. Uh, public uh, support, opposition. Uh, not everyone likes uh, uh, wind farms or uh, uh, large array, large solar arrays. If you need to build electrical transmission lines, you run into lots of uh, problems. You want to uh, build new hydro dams. That's not uh, smooth, necessarily smooth sailing. So the alternatives to uh, fossil fuel aren't uh, guaranteed to be successful if it's not managed very carefully. When I looked at this a, a year or so ago, um, I ran across a, a really interesting concept called socio-technical energy transformation frameworks. It's a big long name, but really it, it comes down to the, the energy companies are, or the oil companies are definitely transitioning to be energy companies. And they, they look at these things in three three layers. So there's the, there's the social <clears throat> layer, the, uh, in our terms, exogenous pressures to look after the environment and all the rest of that stuff. And then right, the, right. the middle layer is the industry, and it's got to go from point A to point B. So the oil industry has to become the energy industry. And then yep. at the bottom, so what this uh, transformation framework suggests is that that, that change, the, the um, adoption of the, of the targets from, this, from the social level are all due to the, the speed of adoption of R&D, of new technology, of new innovations, of way of better in, improvements of efficiency and production and all those things. And then the industry will go and change it in stages as it uh, moves along. So it's really it neat. Yeah, it is. And, and I, um, I, I'm, I, I think it's also ties into the whole idea of value chains because those things that are uh, the inputs to a company's strategy, how far the slider goes from to the left to a three or to the right to a 10 is uh, largely how quickly do they want to achieve those uh, those uh, energy yeah. transition and social benefits. So yeah, it's a it's a huge topic. So I will just say when I was looking at this, the, the multinationals, the big oil companies on the uh, Europe side of the Atlantic seem to yeah. be getting this message a lot faster than the North yeah. American side. But yeah. We'll see, we'll yeah. see how uh, that goes. Just, just another, another aspect following on George's comment about uh, feedback loops and balancing loops is delays. Uh, you know, that this, this, is, this system's got a huge amount of inertia and, and we're yeah. not gonna change overnight. So um, yeah. in my, yeah. at least in my opinion, we're not gonna change overnight. So, um, so recognizing that inertia is important, uh, I think, and somehow communicating that this inertia will will take uh, maybe a situation of a little worse before better result um, mm -hmm. to the public uh, could be could be very important, and I'm not sure if the public's willing to accept a worse before better situation, but mm -hmm. I think that with the inertia in the system, I don't think you can move it as quickly as they want, and that's a huge aspect of almost everything I'm studying in system dynamics, is that is that Things are getting better, but people mm -hmm. want it to get better faster, and they're impatient. Okay. And, yeah. and somehow, maybe somehow, we can yeah. communicate through system dynamics that that yes, it is getting better, and wait for it. Wait, wait a little longer for it to to get better. You know, don't don't be so impatient. Yeah, I think. Well, the, I, sorry, go ahead. I think, and, and system dynamics has a huge um, role that it can play in communicating that message by showing what what the what the fork what can be achieved but also using those uh that forecast to hold the oil companies accountable like if they're missing targets or they're overachieving on targets because yeah. it comes it comes down to a huge change management problem as well and uh uh it's, it's, uh, oil sands the nuclear industry a lot of the companies a lot of those big sectors that need to to make a big shift are are not on top of the communications change management game. They need to yeah. be. Yeah, and I think I think that's a really valid point. That this is a place. Uh, um, 
a huge opportunity, I think, for mm -hmm. system dynamics to step in and start learning how to communicate with the with the public. Um, uh, 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 really learn, learning how to transition. I mean, we've always been so growth destruction, growth destruction. We're, we're trying to avoid destruction. And it's not just the example of what, uh, what is happening uh, between Russia and Ukraine and seeing an entire infrastructure of a whole, you know, of a whole country be destroyed and now take, with destruction come, is a, the, the huge cost of, of complete destruction and rapid destruction is that you've got damages and losses that huge that that's because of destroy of too rapid uh, uh, tra transition and 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 and, and that's where um, educating uh, about the time dependency it's like befriending time again uh, and and learning how to respect the time needed for for these things um i'm wondering if there's maybe room in system dynamics modeling for modeling the whole concept of uh, perception the stakeholder perception so as an example uh, public opposition isn't necessarily based on hard data it's based on their perception no. so yeah. the current perception is that the uh, fossil fuel industry is evil and if their performance uh, changes dramatically due to hard data, like uh, reduced emissions, et cetera, there might be quite a perception delay before the public actually accepts that information as fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, definitely, you know, definitely, uh, I think that, you know, um, system dynamics has, has a real value in, in, in identifying soft variables. Um, yeah. And, you know, perception is a, is a soft variable. And like you say, that there's a delay in the in the in the in the soft variable of perception, that you know the perception doesn't change overnight. And system dynamics has a very nice tool to incorporate delays in in those kind of soft variables. So, yeah. um, so yeah. I, I, no, I'm not sure that other tools really have that kind of capability. That um, you know, so. Like I said, this uh, the delays in the system are huge. There's a lot of inertia in the system, and and like you say, George, um, you know, I, perception is a, is a big part of it, and and it's a soft variable, and and, and system dynamics can really can really highlight things like those soft variables. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, oh, and, I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and, and so and to that point, um, a a lot of the uh, Ivan would probably going to want to jump in here real quick um a lot of the policy guidance that governments get is from uh classic economic macroeconomic models that are not stock flow consistent that don't build in delays that have some really wicked assumptions and, exactly and so so we're faced with a two-edged sword a two-edged problem here one is uh popularizing some of the great results from these sv models but the other one is is uh, really working with some top-notch guys like in um in ottawa dr mark lavois um on stock flow consistent models for econo econometric forecasting and gaining credibility for sd as a as a way to provide decision support for some of these government policies if governments keep banging on oil is bad it's it is just going to always be an uphill battle yeah that's another that's a very huge point as well uh, that i i think is 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 so important is um it, it, it is for example you know um system dynamics uh, feels that um you know economics is um is not useful uh, and I think that's a mistake because um, economics has so much more influence than system dynamics. And instead of just saying that the economics is wrong, uh, I think we have to work, like you say, with the macroeconomists to, to, to show them the value of looking at things, like you say, with dimensional consistency in their, in their macroeconomic models. So, um, so I, I think, you know, in my opinion, system dynamics has, has, has had a fight with economics over the, over the long term, ever since Forrester. And, and, and that has been a mistake. You know, I think that, you know, we, we can't compete with, uh, with the influence of the economists in, in government. 
because uh, they basically they uh, they have um, they have the ear of the politicians because they control things like you know um, interest rates and and issues like that. So um, so I think instead of instead of fighting it, we should join it. You know, so basically yeah. we should we should work with economists. And, and you know, I, we all know that there's um, there's an economist branch of the Systemic Society. And and maybe maybe you know we should we should get involved in that um, as well in, in this area. I think the field that comes closest uh, is behavioral economics. Yeah. Yep. We uh, <laughs> backlash against the traditional economic models of perfect information available to everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but but I think that you know if if you look at influence in government. Uh, the the most influence is in from the macroeconomists, you know those those people are talking about fiscal policy, and and monetary policy, and, and those things really resonate with with politicians, that they can control fiscal policy, they can control uh, monetary policy, and, and I don't know definitely there's there's small things that can be addressed by behavioral economics, but when the government's looking at the big picture of the whole country. They they really turn to macroeconomists. What well, what's it, the next step for uh, for this for this particular group? Not not necessarily just the oil sands modeling, but Martha's group in terms of uh, do we want to follow up on anything? Well, I think the key message is that uh, you get at least three people uh, coming to the meeting if they're the ones presenting. So uh, I I like the idea of ask, you know enticing the the rest of the group. At, to present their work in whatever stage, like WPI has a great uh, a model for um, uh, continuous learning um, um, meetings. Just bring your work in progress and just have some fun, uh, share the ideas, get some feedback, and those those kinds of things. But yeah, yeah. I think you know from from our, from my point of view, um, the issue is um, is getting the word out. And, and, and there's all kinds of different ways to get the word out. Uh, one of them is presentations like this. Others are videos that can be put on YouTube and, and circulated on LinkedIn and, 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 and things like that. And, and so I think we have, to, we have to exploit all of these different approaches to getting the word out. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, this is, I think this has been a great presentation from the point of view of capturing a particular model and a particular message that Sysmonamics, I think, had a unique perspective on. And then uh, I think, like you said, we want to exploit that. We want to we want to send this out to the world. So in, in George's point of what are we going to do next with this model, maybe, maybe not, maybe that wasn't what he was talking about, but with this model, I think, you know, we need to keep presenting it. We need to find more and more places where we can present this model and, and get and get and, and reuse the presentation over and over again to different audiences and, and, and see if, like I said, we uh, we can start influencing people uh, and, and getting them on board with, with using system dynamics in these kind of problems. I'm gonna um, have to leave it here, folks. Uh, this has been lovely. Okay. Thank you to my collaborators, Ivan and George. It was a, it was a great team effort and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah let's and let's great. keep let's keep working on it as uh, uh, so we should have another meeting next week. Great. Well, and thank you for uh, presenting for for presenting and welcome Niamat. Um I'm sorry like I just group. I just messed up with the timing of just time zone oh. because I'm staying at the central so I, I believe like it will be starting at 4 my time. Oh, but I'm darn. so sorry for I'm just an are, hour you, are, are we still recording, Martha? Maybe we can turn uh, off recording. Yeah, I, I'm going to stop recording. Um, so yeah, Nia, Matt, uh, there is the benefit that we have of of, uh, of uh, the fact that this presentation was recorded. And I will let you know where it's available uh, once it's been processed through Google. Um, sure. Yeah.